Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India element theory because earlier we related the thrust, the inflow and the power, rotor disc area only induced using momentum theory, but that does not consider any detail. But now we are going to look at the details of the rotor rotor operating condition, everything. But that is the blade element theory, please understand this is a fundamental. We have to have this theory for all analysis of helicopters and uh, whether it is the flight dynamics, whether it is the aeroelasticity, loads, stability, everything blade element theory is the fundamental. So, you have to know the blade element theory, but to give you a brief history, see it was proposed by, he basically started William Froud in 1878, because blade element theory essentially says that I am going to treat every cross section of the blade, because you know that the rotor blade is essentially a, if you look at that, this is a airfoil shape. Okay. He said, I am going to look at the cross section of the blade, which is an aerofoil, because these are all, please understand, uh, you know, before the flight started, even the fixed wing. But then, the real development was done by Stefan uh, you pronounce it Dreviki or something, it is 1892 to 1920. What he did was the propeller, these are all for propellers, as the propeller is going forward, forward it is not hovering, there is a velocity which is coming okay. and there is a omega r, which is due to rotation velocity at any cross section. But he did not take into account the velocity due to the inflow or the induced velocity. He just took the propeller forward velocity and then the omega r. And when he calculated the thrust, the power etcetera, it was not matching with the experiment because please understand propeller experiments were lot of experiments were conducted earlier for power and thrust and he found that they were not matching because then he felt there is something wrong between theory and experiment and the, the difference he thought it is due to the aspect ratio of the basically the propeller because it is not a long propeller, it is a finite propeller. But he was not sure what is the aerodynamic characteristic I must take into account at every section. So, when he made some correction for aspect ratio, because you know that there is a correction for aspect ratio in the finite wing theory. Similarly, when the trends were okay, but still the results are not good, they are not matching with the experiment. Then several people attempted to see how to take the proper sectional characteristic, because you have two, one is the aspect ratio effect, okay. another one is airfoil characteristic. Okay. 
these are the two things. There is something I have to make adjustment. Okay. So, in uh, 1915 and uh, 1918 and also 17, that is Betts and uh, Botesart and then Page and Collins. See, these are the three group of people. They said, I have to take the induced velocity, okay. but what induced velocity I should take? At the, if I want to calculate the lift here, the propeller, this is going, this is the cross section, omega r is there. Okay. So, you may take, this is my omega r and there is a propeller is going, axial velocity of the propeller, which you may call it v plus some induced flow. Okay. They said we will take the induced flow from momentum theory or something like that, but still, but it is not aspect ratio effect, they started using it. So, you have an aspect ratio effect was also brought, but you took the inflow also. Again, there was a mismatch. So, they found that uh, there is something wrong in the sense, wrong in the sense something inflow, if I take it from momentum theory, if I take the aspect ratio, they do not match. Again, they give a trend. So, they try to adjust some empirical numbers. That is why Fage and Collins, he took the aspect ratio as 6, fixed the number and then he started correcting the inflow by some empirical factor. Okay. This is how it was going on to match the theory experiment purely thrust and power that is all nothing else. But later because Prandtl finite wing theory that is the Prandtl vortex you no know, lifting line theory that was in 1918 when he proposed. Then they said yes, we have to, this is the vortex model because I should take lift is rho u gamma and the gamma is the vorticity and you find out the strength of the gamma from actually the trailing edge because you have to adjust. Lift you say rho u gamma and then you go back and then take a vortex, finite horseshoe vortex okay, and then get the strength of the vortex, then you use it. Then they said yes, we have to use vortex theory to get the proper value of inflow at the place where it is going at the rotor disc. That is why in the beginning, the correct treatment of 2D aerofoil theory for rotors came from vortex theory because two dimensional there is a correction because the vortex is given induced velocity in the that is what you get a induced drag in your fixed wing theory. Okay. So, the vortex theory was dominating in the beginning of the rotors because they said that is the correct treatment. So, everything went in vortex theory approach. Momentum theory was not really looked at, but subsequently then people realized yes, you can take momentum theory okay, and then make, but even today if you want a more precise treatment of induced flow at the rotor disc, induced flow I mean you all know that the flow normal to the rotor disc. If you want to get a correct value because correct is something you know exact is different. There is a vortex model, but that is more complex. Okay. Because if you start looking at the vortex theory as such, if I draw this as the rotor, this is a shaft, this is a rotor, it is rotating. Okay. Okay, this is a shaft. The vortices will be because as it goes, you will find a vortex coming and if the lift is varying along, you will have a vortex sheet actually. 
okay. A sheet will come because this is a lifting line theory. I hope you understand. Some of you may not know lifting line theory. Okay. Okay. And then the strength of the vortex that varies how the lift variation. And then what is the shape of? Because this is going to go in a in the rotor it will go in a helical shape okay because in the finite wing case you will say my vortex sheet is going like the harsh vortex because this is what you say this is a harsh vortex in finite wing the vortex swept back but in the case of uh, rotor hovering rotor the vortex is piling below it it will go in a helical path because as it goes around it leaves and this one pushed down by the induced velocity by its own traction now the structure of the vortex you have to make approximation because if you experimental observations were made on how the vortices look and they found it goes in a some kind of a I will show later some pictures okay it will be like this okay so like that this will go vortex sheet and this what will happen is initially they will start a sheet suddenly they will all bunch up become a tip strong tip vortex because you know that strong tip vortex and how that is convected down. That means you have to take a structure of that, that is the wake structure. Now that you have to know or you say if you have vortex to vortex interaction if you consider then it is called the free wake theory. But if you say I fix my structure of the vortex, it is going to be in a cylindrical, vertical cylinder that is all. No deformation then I call it prescribed wake. So, either I prescribe the wake structure that is a relatively easy, but if I do not prescribe I say ok let it evolve by itself that is the free wake theory, but it is more complex even prescribed wake free wake both are complex. Now, of course, people have developed their own computational codes using vortex theory. Today I am telling you vortex theory is there, it is used. But the beauty is if I consider a hovering rotor and then you assume that the vortex is in a cylinder okay, and it is a infinite number of blades actuator disk okay that means it is just a lot of circular continuous vortices okay it's easy for integration that was what was done earlier cylindrical wake structure and infinite number of blades means there is no gap between one and the other please understand one blade gives a wake it will come down then there is another blade that will also give that means there will be several helical wake and there will be gap between those wakes because you get one coming down then if you say another blade end that will come and they will go intertwined but if you have infinite number it is almost like a continuous cylinder when you use a cylindrical wake like this the induced flow calculated by this approach at the rotor disc is same as momentum theory okay uniform loading okay uniform thing you take then you get the same result so what happens is okay momentum theory is not all that bad all right so we use in this course 
momentum theory. Please understand, momentum theory is even today in research it is used. Okay, I will show you later how we use it. Because if you want to have vortex theory, then you need to sit and develop. This is like a pretty much computationally more intensive. Whereas you will find even with the momentum theory, the results which you predict are reasonably good, pretty good I would say, but you have to make some corrections here, there, etcetera. With that, your results will be good and that is why momentum theory is still used in rotor analysis. This some people may use it, that is a different point. It is a, then a school of thought and if you want to complicate it, but it does not mean that everything you are able to predict because the wake structure unless it is correct and you do not know because the viscosity will diffuse the wake, how far you must go down. So, there is one group of researchers working on wake, that type of prescribed wake, free wake analysis. Another group they said that okay, I need an inflow because now you see the research itself was directing towards whether modeling the inflow accurately, that is the research. I do not do anything else except my focus is inflow modeling. How do I know what is the velocity at every point on the rotor disc? Even today it is a research. Later you will find how that itself gets complicated. Another one is, hey, I have a good theory, pretty decent, which is easy to incorporate in my aeroelastic loads response analysis, because I need to do that also. So, you see the research, if I somebody focuses on only aerodynamics related problems, he will be focusing on only that inflow calculus, he may not get into rest of the things. But if you are working on aeroelasticity, loads, stability, etcetera of the vehicle, you need to know the inflow. You say I will calculate by momentum theory, which is easy to incorporate, but of course, that will be somewhere, but it is not too bad, that is what I am saying it still gives the results which are quite close, but of course, there are always differences. Now, one can debate on whether one should use always this theory or the other theory, then you will find slowly as we proceed, even that has certain drawbacks. Okay? Now, I just gave a brief introduction with the field, how the research in inflow calculation is important particularly, but we will use not vortex theory, we will use simple momentum theory, but then we will complicate it, not the uniform inflow, that is what we did in the momentum theory. The flow over the disk is constant at every location, that is uniform inflow. Later you will see, hey, that is too gross an approximation, let me have non-uniform inflow. Okay? That means, it is varying along the radial direction. Of course, if you want more complex in general various other situation, you can say it varies everywhere. Okay? So, that is how the complexity in the Momentum theory also went up and today that is also there, there is one theory which is a dynamic wake theory which is somewhat similar to this, somewhat similar. So, please understand that model is what we use, dynamic wake, we do not model this, we use another theory to get the time varying inflow at the rotor disc. Please understand, we use till now constant, it does not vary with time, constant and uniform everywhere. Okay. Now, you say initial development, we learned that it is a constant, it is uniform, first theory. Okay. That is what I am going to uh, discuss now. 
do not think that that is the end of it, because there is a lot more in the theory, in the inflow modeling alone. Okay. So, when we go to the research level, we do a little bit more complex thing. Okay. Now, what is the blade element theory? This is a rotor blade which is rotating. So, I said the cross section is this. I know what is the oncoming velocity, it is a two dimensional model that is all 2 D airfoil model. There is a omega r. Let us first consider hover and vertical flight. Okay. In the sense the disc can go straight up or down is a little we will do that later vertical flight and up and down that has its own complexities. Okay. We will do one by one slowly. Here I said that this is the rotor blade which is rotating with a angular velocity omega and this is my frame x and z and this is y which is attached to the blade, it keeps going. Now, I look at a cross section which is at a distance r from the center of the disc or you can say center of the hub that is r. So, your velocity is omega r, simple because please note this is only an introduction. Okay. When you go to actual blade, it is not omega r alone, you have so many other terms will start coming in. So, that is why when we start the course, you learn basics. Okay. And then at this, this is a small elemental cross section dr, okay. because please note my omega r is changing depending on the radius. That is why that lower case r is used for running variable along the span of the blade. Now, I have omega r and I assume that this is the climb you may put a subscript v c to denote it is a climb velocity and nu is induced velocity. You do not know that, but you say I know it somehow. You may get it from any theory. Okay. That is where you can use momentum theory, you can use vortex theory etcetera. And that is why I mark u p which is perpendicular to the disc. So, now I have a disc and this blade is going in the disc, please understand it is not coming out or anything like that, we will do later one by one. Okay. This is just a very, very simple theory. So, this is rotating and there is a normal flow. So, I have V c and nu. Now, if this is kept at a pitch angle theta with respect to the this oncoming flow. Now, you can get the relative velocity as well as the angle of effective angle of attack you can say. So, this is the phi, okay. phi is the change because of the normal flow. So, you will have your resultant velocity 
u is okay this is my resultant velocity but for simplicity you know because of uh, every time you don't want to carry this you use the symbol u p that is the velocity perpendicular to the disk this you call it as v c plus nu and u t which is omega r this is tangential velocity this is the normal velocity instead of calling normal n you call it u p so this is u t this is u p okay this is a general symbol this is a standard notation that is used so that it's ease of understanding u t is tangential u p is normal only everything with reference to the airfoil now immediately you go back what is my effective because you know that tan phi is u p over u t tan phi is u p over u t and now I have to define sectional lift sectional drag that is all and lift is normal to the I use simple 2D aerofoil theory lift is normal to the oncoming flow and drag is along the oncoming flow. So, now you see and I define some psi just to denote the azimuth location. This is for one blade if I have n number of blades I will use all the blades everything ok. Now I got sectional lift and drag ok. This is for the please note very very simple model and this is what I have shown here ok. So, u p u t and this is the resultant u and theta is the pitch angle and alpha is the effective angle of attack ok. So, you see effective angle of attack is what is now you remember why I used pilot input gives pitch change it does not change the angle of attack it will change indirectly but he gives only pitch change in the sense he changes this angle but the angle of attack changes depending on what is the up what is the ut etc okay i may assume now this induced velocity nu to be constant over the rotor disc that is it is not a function of r it is a constant it is a hovering theory it is hovering or climb it is not a function of radial it is a constant. Then you see the phi changes because of omega r ok. So, every cross section because the tangential velocity is changing. So, automatically my effective angle of attack which I call it alpha, alpha is theta minus phi which you may call it theta minus tan inverse u p over u t and then I am going to make approximation straight away right here. So, please understand right at the definition of angle of attack you have tan coming in ok. You make now an approximation because in a textbook form if I have to give you a closed form solution ok computationally you can always take tan inverse no problem. But you know that as r this is nothing but what v climb plus nu over omega r as r decreases 
is very large. That means, phi is going to become more and more as you come near the root. Okay. And that means, the angle of attack whatever you put because this value will be drastically increasing. <laughs> okay, theta may be fixed, but this will keep on increasing, but then you are going to have problems. But usually what happens is your aerodynamic section okay, starts not from the center of the hub and another thing is the omega r the dynamic pressure due to velocity. Omega r is very small near the root. Okay. Therefore, you make an error, but you say it's all right, I, I accept that error. So, I represent this tan inverse because I assume this angle is small. So, please understand, I assume phi is small, I write it u p over u t, tan phi is phi. Uh, okay. Okay. Tan phi is phi, when phi is small, u p over u t, but I am violating this rule as I come closer to the hub, but I still say it is all right, I accept it because I know that dynamic pressure is very low, so the lift is not very large. So, I make usually you will find the aerodynamic section of the rotor blade starts about 20, 25 percent away from the center because of the geometry, because you have to have a hub, you have to have attachment, everything. So, it will be around 20 percent, 20, 25 percent and the error you make in that is not a lot. Okay. That is why you make this approximation first theta minus u p. Now, you know angle of attack. Okay. And I can write the lift per unit span okay. straight from your aerodynamics. Lift per unit span is lift per unit span, please understand. Otherwise, over a small element, you put a dr. You will have half rho u square card and cl. This is lift and the drag will be, if you want to put, you can put a dr, okay. half, this is per unit span, this is the lift at c, c, d. Okay. This is my, at any small element. Now, if I want to get the total lift, I need to go and integrate, that is all. Now, I make more approximation. Okay. The more approximation is, I am going to call now u, I say omega r is because when phi is small, basically omega r is large. So, when omega r is large, this is a small quantity. So, I which is basically u u t. Okay. So, I represent my u as u t, resultant velocity as u t. Okay. But that does not mean I change the angle of attack also. I keep alpha as this. Now, I know directly I go back, I write my lift as half rho u t square. This is an approximation I am making okay. and c, now what is my c l? c l, this is from your elementary okay. c l alpha lift curve slope times the angle of attack. Now, if I substitute here this value C C L, I will get C L alpha into theta is the 
which input minus phi is u p over u t okay, into d r. Okay. This is the approximate expression. Now, you see this is much easier if I write it, I take the half row c u t square I take it inside. So, you will have C L alpha u t square is omega r theta minus u p u t. Okay. All right. And u p you know v plus nu u t is omega r. Now, it is easy for me to integrate along the radius. On the other hand, if I put divided by omega r and every other factor, I do not take it, you know, it is going to become a messy stuff. Okay. That is what is done first. Now, this is my lift for an elemental length. If I want the total, I go back. So, I erase this part. Okay. total thrust, total thrust is total lift that acts on all the blades in the rotor system. That means, I assume every blade in hover behaves the same way. Okay. That means, I will simply put number of blades n all right. and then I have to integrate from this expression, I will put 0 to capital R, R the entire expression you write this, you will have the full expression, which is uh, maybe I will write this, then I will do the non dimensionalization because that is important. Okay. So, you will have this is n 0 to R half rho c c l alpha omega r whole square theta minus u p is v climb plus nu and u t is omega r into d r. Okay. This is my thrust, rotor thrust. Now, Usually, we non dimensionalize the quantity, we do not carry this whole thing. When we non dimensionalize, we use a I erase this part here velocity quantities are normalized with respect to tip speed, and you use omega r. So, you see C t is thrust coefficient is thrust divided by rho. pi r square, this is the area of the rotor disc and omega okay. this is my C t. Now, I divide this entire quantity by this okay. So, now please understand one thing. density card, card can vary along the blade. Okay. But if my today most of the rotor blades actually they have a constant card except near the root. Okay. Otherwise, your card can vary because that is what your small model card is varying. So, you cannot use the same expression, you have to put that integration. But normally what is done is we take some constant card etcetera and then we calculate. Now, when I do this, I get a quantity, I will just briefly describe, I will have n 0 to r. So, I am going to divide divided by rho pi r square omega capital R whole square. Okay. This is what I am dividing 
when I divide, let me write the expression here. Okay. C t, I will have n, there is a half factor outside. Anyway, rho will cancel out. Okay. Now, omega r whole square, you take it here. When you take it here, this will be omega square will go of r bar square. We write it as, I will say integral, leave it, it is essentially 0 to 1 it will become. Okay. Because pi r square is there. Okay. There is a c, there is a dr. So, one of the r you take it to this, that will become r bar. So, I will make this bracket here, this will be d r bar. r bar means r over r, so integral is 0 to 1, right. Now, inside quantity, let me first write it, that is r bar square theta minus, I am going to call this symbol, this V c plus nu over omega capital R by a new symbol which is lambda. Lambda is inflow, okay. please understand this includes climb and induced velocity. Okay. Later, I may split this lambda c and then nu, some lambda i. Okay. But right now, I am calling it as lambda because this itself you can write it as lambda c plus lambda i. That means, sorry, c is climb, i is induced. You can split, that is later. Right now, we will take it as lambda and one omega r gone, another one lambda r bar. Okay. So, this is gone, then you are left with pi r. Okay. So, I can have here, there is a c and okay. because there is a one of the r has gone to r bar. Now, if you assume it is a constant card, okay, then you can take out the constant card means c also outside. So, I will take the c outside. Now, this quantity I am going to call it as sigma, which is essentially blade area okay, over disk because if I multiply r and square, this is c r is card into span that is the blade area, n is number of blades. So, because please note all blades are identical. So, you will have sigma blade area over disk area, this is called solidity. Okay. Solidity ratio. Okay. Now, I can write this entire quantity as sigma over 2. Okay. And then there is a C L alpha I have to add. So, C L alpha is there, sorry I forgot to put that C L alpha because this is there okay. and C L alpha you may call it C L alpha or sometimes we call it A by the symbol C L alpha or A, A. both mean the same. Okay. Now, you are left with uh, completely this solidity ratio is important usually 
blade area divided by disc area. Okay. And this is an important parameter like you have thrust coefficient. Now, we have introduced one more new quantity which is the solidity ratio of the rotor because that is that plays a key role as we go along you will see. Okay. Now, this is what my expression for C t. Okay. Now, this is the lift it acts please understand. Now, I go back here a little we make a we made some approximation what is my lift? Lift is normal to the resultant flow right and drag is along the resultant flow and I said in my hub coordinate system x is in the plane of the hub z is normal to that. I should take if I want actually the force normal to the rotor disc or the hub. I must resolve these two components L and D along vertical and this x direction that is a precise. Now, I go and do that. I have written here normal force F z is L cosine phi minus d sin phi because that is the you subtract because this is the resultant is coming here this is omega r. So, you have your L your I think I should ok this is L this is d and this angle is phi this angle is phi this is we said x this is we said z. So, L cos phi minus d sin phi. So, I must drag drag also into account and then in plane force is L sin phi plus d cos phi. Now, I make another approximation that because my phi is small and the drag is usually for a aerofoil is very small ok. It is you can take it at the most 0 0.01 whereas, lift C L is C L alpha that is 2 pi. So, you say my drag is very small therefore, F z please understand F z I say is L directly ok. Now, that is what I have used only L in defining the thrust coefficient. That means, basically this is normal to the rotor disc that is all this is approximation I make this. But in the case of a in plane force I say f x I cannot neglect lift lift is large phi is small. So, I am going to write it as L phi plus d ok. Because phi is small, so cosine phi I take it as 1, sin phi I call it as phi. Whereas, when I go here d is also small, phi is also small, so product is much smaller, so I neglect that. Whereas, when I come here I do not do that. So, this is the now you understand right at the beginning I make all sorts of approximations ok. That is what I have given here I put it on elemental thrust because this is just to indicate to you what all we have done L d r L is lift per unit span, this is dr, here I have modified slightly and then n is number of blades, d t is actually thrust which is f z, okay. this is per unit area. So, I multiply by dr, is it clear and then when I go for 
torque because I am not interested in the drag force. I want to see what is the torque because drag force I won't just integrate it. I will integrate and then get what is the torque required to rotate. But later if I want hub, hub loads I need to get the drag also I will do that later. But right now I am calculating only the torque is L phi because I have approximated F x L phi plus d and it is acting at a distance r from the center. So, the drag force into distance is elemental torque okay. and the power into omega because torque into omega is power. Okay. Now, I have all the three quantities elemental thrust, elemental torque, elemental power. I have only shown you this particular thing. If I integrate this, okay, before I, I let me write the expression C t is here I put what sigma. Now, C l alpha what type of airfoil you are having at every section, okay? whether it is a constant because it can vary because we said card is a constant, but my airfoil can change, but we make again no I am going to have the same airfoil throughout. Okay. Now, C L alpha also comes out which I call it as using the symbol A because most of the helicopter uh, literature they use the symbol A. Okay. Lift curve slope C L alpha is A sigma A over 2 0 to 1 r bar square theta minus lambda r bar into d r bar. Okay. This is my C T which is the non dimensional actually the first expression d t is there right. If I integrate the d t over r I will really this is the thrust that is normalized I get this expression. Okay. Now, how my theta is varying along the blade? I said pilot gives an input that is the pilot input he gives at the root, but the blade itself can be twisted that means there can have a pre twist in the blade geometric twist that means what initially pilot gives and then what is the angle and as it goes what is the pitch angle at every cross section of the blade that you have to take it. Now, here only there are if it is a constant, constant means there is no twist, zero twist. Zero twist means you can directly take it. Okay. If you integrate, it is very simple. Assume zero twist. Okay. Theta is a constant everywhere. This is very simple. This is what C t becomes sigma a over 2 theta over 3 minus lambda over 2 that is all. Okay, very simple expression, but you do not know lambda that is a different thing, but if it is hover we will see how we get it from if you have a twist built in in the blade then you have to take that into account usually rotor blades they do with a linear twist okay linear twist means the angle theta varies linearly from root to tip with a reduction so you can write it in a form where you have a twist. 
then you can integrate fully. Okay. Now, why do you give twist? That is another question. So, you can have, but then the proof for twist if you give, you vary your inflow also. There is a little different because we still have not obtained this value, please understand. If you use momentum theory, assuming power, okay, I am just going a little, only with this I am discussing, I am not gone to the other two terms, only this term, zero twist, I am considering hover, then lambda becomes lambda i, that is all, induced, because there is no climb. Then I will have my C t is sigma a over 2 theta over 3 minus lambda i over 2. But momentum theory hover gave me what? Lambda is root of right? sorry lambda i, I should use the symbol lambda i, because this is for hover. Okay. Now, blade element theory is relating pitch angle, induced flow, solidity and airfoil characteristic, because all these are there, number of blades. Actually, this is a non-dimensional quantity. If you want, then operating condition is there, angle of attack, everything is there. Now, I can substitute for lambda i here okay. and then I can get theta. Okay. Directly, what should be the pitch angle I must give? if I want to have this much C t. Okay. Then once I get the, once I know the C t, I can get the inflow. On the other hand, in an experiment, if I give a pitch angle, I must know what should be the C t. That means, I have to do iteration, because first I assume the value of theta, then I do not know this value, okay. I may take it as 0, you follow. Then I put the value of theta, I get a C t. When I get the C t, I go back and substitute here. Then I get the lambda i, I put it back here. Then I get the new value of C t, go back do the iteration. That is in a wind tunnel test, if you want to correlate, hey, I have given this much pitch angle, what is my thrust? Okay, because these tests are done, lot of. So, you see only these two equations, you are using only these two. Now, in helicopters, you understand that you cannot live with only momentum theory or you cannot live only with the blade element theory. You can replace the momentum theory by some other theory, vortex theory, but this is essential, blade element theory is essential. So, you always have two theories, either you say I take prescribed wake or free wake, any analysis and then I get the inflow, then use that inflow, put it here, get the thrust, then go back again to see whether that thrust gives me that inflow. Okay, now, you see the loop of the calculation in just a very simple problem. If I give you a weight of the helicopter and the rotor radius, some C L alpha, airfoil shape, etcetera, calculate what should be the pitch angle, you should be able to do it. Okay. Now, I will just uh, compile this stuff and then write it uh, here. Later, we will see the twist part, right now untwisted. Okay. 
0 twist. So, I have C t and 0 twist and hover, please understand because I am doing both C t becomes sigma a over 2 theta over 3 minus lambda i over and lambda i from momentum theory is root of C t over 2. Now, I just want to this for practical purposes. You substitute this here and then collect the terms of C t on one side, just in this expression. If you do that, you will get what? 2 C t over sigma a, this is theta over 3 equals this will go here plus 1 over 2. So, I take the 3, please understand I am taking the 3 here and put it 6. Okay. Zero twist hover. If I know the thrust coefficient, please understand. If I know the thrust coefficient, that means I know CT. Thrust coefficient I know because that is the weight of the helicopter. I now you see, I don't really thrust coefficient. I equate to sometimes people say weight coefficient. Basically, weight is supported by the thrust. You say thrust coefficient is equal to C t equal to C w. Please understand. So, I use this approximation again here. If you are given the weight of the helicopter, if it has to hover, w you say that is t, that is all weight is equal to the thrust. So, you will have C w is C t weight coefficient, thrust coefficient, weight coefficient is nothing but w by rho again pi r square omega r whole square, okay, which is same as if you are given a helicopter with the radius and with the rotor angular velocity, you can get the C t. Now, you see what should be my pitch angle, I must provide for hover. Okay. You substitute the value. Here this quantity, you know that A which is the lift curve slope is theoretical value is 2 pi, okay. theoretical value is 2 pi which is almost close to 6. So, you knock this out. Now, you see C t by sigma, this is the mean angle, this is the term due to variation in the because of the inflow, because of the inflow there is a change. Okay. C t over sigma, now please understand why this parameter becomes important thrust coefficient over sigma, this gives you mean angle okay, approximately straight shot because sigma takes n c over pi r, c t is thrust coefficient. Now, you will immediately say hey, what should be the angle I must provide for hover, just mean value this you if you take it it is okay. if you neglect it it is all right. That is why in practical situations helicopters they always want C t over sigma, what is the value? Because that tells you what is the angle you must provide. Suppose if this value becomes uh, for the aerofile 15 degrees, then it is you are nearing stall okay, of the blade. Okay. So, it gives you a do not go, you immediately see if I increase my solidity ratio. I reduce the angle for hover, that means my aerofile is good. But if I reduce my solidity, 
I am actually increasing my angle of operation, but you may stall. So, these are very important. You have to operate and if you are near the stall angle, if you want to climb up, because this is for hover. If I want to, I have to increase my thrust, increase my thrust, I increase my collective, but what will happen is you will not be able to lift, the blade will stall. So, this is very, very important C T over sigma as a parameter. Okay. This is also called blade loading. Okay. Why it is called blade loading, I will briefly describe. 